Hello, this is SJD. In this video, we'll be looking at examples and experiments in how to create polygonal stonework. So this is from Temple of Dendera. Uh, we're looking at the top view of a layer of stones. Of course, all links will be in the description, but this is one example. Now, those are not regular blocks. We'll go into what might appear to be straight lines are not always straight. They have a subtle curve. Some blocks have eight or even in other cases more than eight faces so it's polygonal stonework so I'll be linking this this is a translated the relevant parts and the photos from the PDF uh, Anton Antoine Garrick sent me this PDF I was very happy to receive it because my older slower shorter feeble-minded brother had found it and sent it to me at least for keywords and I was trying to track it down my computer crashed, I lost all of the open tabs I had, and just one of those lovely synchronicities that uh, in my email uh, shortly after I received this paper from Antoine Garrick himself. Joint soaring technique in Ptolemaic sandstone masonry. Uh, just to be, he's talking Ptolemaic and sandstone masonry, but this would work much wider. But just to, for this particular video, we'll be sticking essentially Iron Age and Ptolemaic sandstone. Antoine Garrick, leading engineer involved in the reconstruction of the Karnak Temple Complex. You can see there on the top right, uh, he's the guy who's leading this to put all these pieces back together. Knows his stuff, he's on the, in the field. Again, not, you know, um, evil, you know, they don't pay attention to these type of things, the academics, academic, but uh, actually they do, and they're quite interesting and very grateful for this. Now, uh, he was... Uh, working with Emmanuel Laroche, pardon the pronunciation, and I'll put a link to this video and uh, this one as well. Okay, this one is in French, but because of a PDF is in lower res, I've replaced uh, with as many higher res pictures as I can. But even just in this talk, if you scroll through, you can see the imagery of what they're trying to replicate and the experiment that they conducted themselves. So uh, here's another abstract. In order to adjust both blocks perfectly, the ancient builders have developed a simple and efficient technique which involves cutting simultaneously with a saw uh, along the common joint. The process, process gives exactly the same shape on both faces of the two stones which have been fitted together. So after a last push, the joint is perfect. Although there are numerous and well-known examples about this technique in the Roman world, the cases on pharaonic buildings are rarely reported. Recent observations of some temples in Upper Egypt lead us to believe that the joint sawing was a common practice during the Ptolemaic period. The process concerns for both the vertical and horizontal joints. The study of specific marks left by the stone on the saw, the experimentation and the analysis of tools already exhumed can reveal the different steps of the technique of joint sawing. Basically you get two uh, rough stones that are roughly the same shape you butt them together and then you cut down the middle now if you think if you cut a piece of wood those pieces are going to fit back together you cut a piece of stone those pieces are going to slide back together it's brilliantly simple and of course the evidence is there but it's just a wonderful simple way of doing it and so for instance he's mentioning the roman world that's because i had the picks off by hand now the parthenon people think oh this is uh modular they're just 90 degree blocks and it's got nothing to do with the other ancient perfectly fit stonework because these are no uh the parthenon and other roman buildings each stone is individually fitted there are no right angles there are no straight lines it's all about curves every single block has been perfectly fitted with the one next to it um if it was an egyptian and in granite well it's polygonal magic if it's let's you know don't go to athens anyway uh that's what i'll say now Here's some examples again. All the links are in the description unless specified. Otherwise, it comes from the paper sent by Anton, um, Antoine Garic. And you see this type of fitted stone, horizontal courses, dandera. It's all we saw earlier. This is the top view of those stones. Now, I've just outlined them. So now we can see that they're not blocks. They're not right angles. Each block is individually fit to the one next to it. And in some cases, they have seven sides or more this is polygonal masonry and we'll see again in a moment there are not they're not straight lines they're individually fitted with subtle curves sometimes more obvious curves this is polygonal masonry 
uh, the clamps as well but we won't go into that for this video and you also notice so I have the bit that I've highlighted and you can see where I haven't highlighted that's called anophyrosis uh, translates to doorway very common technique to perfectly fit stones in that you shallow out groove out in the middle so that only the outsides of the stones need to be meet touching their neighbors common technique for instance uh, Saxa Waiman in uh, South America perfectly fitted on the outside but when you see from behind they got gaps in there because that's not seen you don't need to perfectly fit those so you can't stick a needle inside and and this is there's a secondary reason for this the metal clamps hold them together but they also use this anaphyrosis to uh, put in a liquid slurry like a mortar a grout which will then bond and hold the stones together stop uh, plants and roots getting in there and damaging that type of stuff as well so it's polygonal masonry it's what it is okay uh, here's a cup another example this shows the sandstone quarry um, uh, Gebel Sisala, I always get the pronunciation, but it's an important sandstone quarry. You might notice these type of marks um, where I've, and, but anyway, now you can see the corresponding to the Temple of Kalabsha uh, and the levels of the blocks there. He's in the same temple and notice the block work on the, on the wall, of course. Trace that out. It's polygonal. Each stone individual. Uh, probably not a right angle in the whole joint if there is one it was because it was by accident more than anything the blocks are irregular there's little joints and it's polygonal stonework okay here's another example from the temple of Konsu at Karnak and again just uh, especially on the lower half of the image it's polygonal it's more than four sides all the angles are different and uh, because sandstone and limestone don't hold a corner as well, that's another reason, but we'll get into that because I just want to stick with this Ptolemaic era stuff. Um, Temple of Ope, or is it Opet at Karnak? And uh, again, just common building style, inner stones. What you're not going to see is roughly shaped It's because it's hidden. It doesn't need to be seen. That's the same on the pyramid. Um, Again, in South America, where you'll see those fantastic walls. Again, behind it, the walls, it's uh, very low quality, if not just you know the most basic of of techniques. It's only the outside of the stone of the surface that's tightly fitted. Only what's to be seen to the eye, and even that's just the outside portion of it, because behind there it's not seen, and so you don't need to fit those. Uh, another example of the same temple here is uh, Dendera as well, the steps. And again, the metal clamps, traces of anaphyrosis, uh, but you'll also note that the wall there. So this method will go, oh, but the stones are curved in, in South America or these other places. Well, all of these stones are curved too. And on top of that, um, if you look into, for instance, the Parthenon, which appears to have regular blocks, those blocks are sized in such a way that if you're looking at the temple from a certain angle, it creates optical illusions. There's a beautiful like level of design goes to the next level of highness. and But the blocks also have that advantage of being individually fitted polygonal, so they're not going to shake about and be disrupted as much. So you have the advantage of what appears to be regular blocks but you have the you're able you have the advantage of polygonal stone which now gives you the um for instance in classical parthen on the uh, temple of saturn and so forth optical illusions are built in there but uh, again not modular blocks each is indiv individually fitted it's about putting curves together uh, he's from the Temple of the East at Karnak, and we'll come to this image because what you're seeing is well, there's a few things going on here. The metal clamps, of course, you see that big trench cut down the middle. That's where you could where they inject the slurry. I hope my cursor shows up right, and you can see where the anaphyrosis or the gap that's in the centre of a stone has been filled up with this slurry. Again, on the outside, they fit nicely. 
when they're not showing, what's the point? And very rarely is the case. Uh, this is so on the Great Pyramid as well, and many of these other places um, as well. There are some cases of stones that have fit throughout um, the wall in Machu Picchu, for instance, is one. But they're relatively small stones. They could be manhandled, lifted up. Uh, there's another technique to perfectly fit stone in that way. And as long as you're not talking giant, heavy blocks, still could be done with that case. But it's now logistically a nightmare to lift and pull up. But uh, those that are fitted are, tend to be uh, are, are small in that case. All right, so again, metal clamps, that's where the slurry was poured in. Here's a sample of um, the grout that's been injected in there. Here are some various examples. And again, these walls, from a distance, they might be straight. But again, subtle curved, polygonal design. It's not just four-sided blocks. And also... Uh, overcuts as well. Here's some more examples, again like beautifully fitted stone, if this uh, wasn't sandstone you wouldn't have the damage on the corners as much but again not straight lines, fitted perfectly wonderfully uh, highlight that again so because of the low res from the PDF but again you just extend a straight line and you can see how the white line there which begins on either side and there's a curve there. This is again in any you know, polygonal masonry is really five sides or more but fitting curves that sort of seems to be a thing that um what's the you know big mystery but okay it's not but uh just another example like these blocks fitted beautifully not straight lines uh, they also talk about uh, damage that they see, so the, the method that they're proposing, it's not just that it works, but they've, they've been at these places, they're, in, they're involved in the reconstruction, they know their stuff inside and out, so they can spot even damage that's been done. Uh, again, um, perfectly fit when it needs to be, and then it's not on the other and limestone as well so we're going to bring up so whether it's limestone or sandstone you can cut relatively fast that's this is a relative term but certain like it doesn't take years or months or what you will often hear it doesn't take anywhere near that long but sandstone and limestone this will work and it'll also work in granite too but just now the cutting rate is much slower but still okay want to stick with Ptolemaic and that period so they also point out you'll see other examples for instance at the bent pyramid where they, the evidence for saw marks and saw cutting there to uh, this being a method to bring together uh, use of mortar at Karnak and we'll come back because this is now in into granite country but they also mention the six pile on at Karnak which is often described as this you know uh, literally described ma the masons we were with could not explain they said this is impossible to do by hand uh and that there is an overcut um then that this is it must be lost high tech because the masons that's on the tour with and these tool marks that categorically could not be made by the tools in the archaeological record uh what can you say about that really but we'll have to go into more into that because it's just one of those common ones and it's just stated like categorically could not the tool marks categorically could not have been made by the tools in the archaeological record that is you can argue whether they were or not but to say things like that that's just not that is un untrue and a simple experiment any sort of time uh, would prove that as well. But the question is now, how did uh, they do these polygonal walls? And it's beautifully simple in its explanation, and that's from the Osova tools and the marks found in the record. So how did they do that? We'll look at that. So how was it done? Here we see an illustration and a diagram of experimental structure in sandstone blocks with indication of the terms used so that's what they did now this is how simple and beautiful it is so if i take a single block and i cut it in half because the saw is defining the cut the distance we just push them together 
and now those blocks are going to fit perfectly because the saw is the difference between each side and well instead of cutting a block in half you get two blocks roughly fit rub get them against one another and then just cut your saw blade uh, down through and it's just it's going to make it fit because the, the saw will follow the, the path so if it's straight or slightly curved the saw is going to follow that path and it's just going to mirror it and you just push them together it's wonderfully simple um, they're talking about uh, Ptolemaic in sandstone where you could of course do it in limestone so they're working in the iron age um, and so their saw that's what the saw it's an iron blade just as easily could be replaced with copper. I just showed in the video you can and cut. It's a nice fine grain um, sandstone, but it, it's softer now. Let's just do. Uh, first, I'll use the, the grub saw. And uh, so I'm going to start a cut there. Doesn't take long. Uh, even no abrasive, just with a um, toothed copper saw. cut down a few mil into the sandstone. Sandstone has a Mohs hardness of seven, which is the same as granite. Um, obviously has been damaged done to the sandstone. The softer uh, three and a half to four on Mohs skull copper saw is uh, hardly a dent um, in it, if any damage at all. So you can cut uh, sandstone. This is a tougher sandstone. We have copper. I just showed in the video you can cut sandstone, limestone, granite with copper, but uh, just how easy it is with sandstone. And with the same tool. Now, these tool. remember, uh, Antoine Goric is the, the, the man when it comes to uh, Karnak Temple, especially, and these are some of the copper saws that were found at Karnak and we know that they're stone saws because of the damage done to them they're not mislabeled wood saws the the damage that's been done clearly um, indicates as such now so how does the, the method work now as I said you get two blocks now you've already got one the yellow okay so you bring the next block up next to it and it's going to touch at one point because it isn't perfectly fit well, you just run the saw down and it's going to create a gap that's going to be equal at the top or the bottom. If the gap is larger than the saw blade, well, you just push the blocks together and you cut once more. So what happens is, by the second cut, it's now gone through and now you have two perfectly shaped bits of stone to butt against one another. Now, also notice that uh, as the saw Okay. As the saw goes down, you'll often see overcuts where it's cut into the stone underneath. Uh, now, exactly the same, but to say in the opposite, where the top of the stone is touching, but you want the bot, you, you know, the bottom has a gap. Well, it's exactly the same principle. You run the saw through. If you can't get it close enough, it only takes one run at it. Well, you just run it through again. All depends on how closely the rough stone and again that's basic masonry to get those sides together so for them even to do a double run with the blade probably not very likely uh because they'd be able to get it nicer than that if they were any uh in a decent level of skills and again that will come to again you just just like cutting a block in half they're going to match up and that's wonderfully simple in that way and now the overcut if we go to the next one, so uh, for instance, he shows the evidence for these overcuts where the saw's gone through. And I'll also link um, Christian Ubertini. Uh, he's got an interesting page on that as well. And again, these saw marks where the saw has run over and cut into the block below. Again, you can see examples of that in these images as well. Uh, that one I showed earlier, again, that's got the same 
mark on it as well. You can even see where it's very smooth on the outside and we still have quarrying marks towards the center of the anaphyrosis. So in regards to their experiment, so, uh, even with the low res, you can see it's sort of fitted fairly well there, but we have large gaps on that side of the block. So how did they do that? Well, it's very simple. They put a wedge and then run the saw. So there's the saw and in the background is the wedge. And then they get a really nice cut. Now let's go back. There was an illustration. Before, maybe. Oh, no, might be ahead. Okay, there you go. So, to get the blocks fit, because uh, it's slow, but you put, we have some wedges which are holding them up, and then they're running the saw through. So, you should be able to see. Okay, now we have a nice even gap, which is defined by the wedges, and there you can see the progress of the saw and then it's fine in there so you just have to keep cutting to the edge and then that dark line the thick line is going to go all the way through and then the stone is going to match the one beneath after you've set it to the one on the side again you can see the thickness of the saw cut and then the thin edge which hasn't been wedged yet and then we get a nice cut left over at the end so just like that, we cut down and the saw is going to define that gap and it's going to perfectly fit with the one next to it. Put them together and then we have let's go, the bottom of the stone is very rough. Okay, that doesn't fit. So you, again, you just take the saw and you run it through and because well, it's going to go basically where you guide it but also through the path of least resistance. So it's going to just pick up so you start cutting cut in once it gets past halfway the stone's going to want to tip over so you stick a wedge in there or a spacer and as you go further over you stick another wedge in and you saw through and then you just push them together wonderfully wonderfully simple and uh, but based on the actual saw marks and the tools that are left there easy to do so they did the same here with a angled block. The one on the right, you can see it's, you can see the gaps, it's not very well fit. The one on the left, they ran the saw through and got a nice fit in there. And so just an illustration, you know, where you have, I just drew over the top, you can see there are these noticeable gaps between those two faces. But you run your saw, whether it's iron or copper, and it's gonna, well, make these fit polygonal walls. Uh, here's a, one of our blocks and this is another important feature of this. Trace that out. Okay, the yellow parts is what's going to touch because everything else in the block has been deliberately set, recessed inwards. There's going to be an empty space there. That space will allow for the mortar, the slurry to pour in afterwards but it also means that the saw is only ever going to be touching those parts. So it's not just like sawing through the whole thing. You're only going to, ever going to run along those yellow parts. So on a larger block with a larger blade, you get through. But again, just you only need to cut those parts, common technique. And again, that uh, the low point is that method's anaphyrosis. So once you uh, Temple of Dendera, uh, notice Antonio Calvi stuck his name up there as well, but what we have is the same method you'll see everywhere. Uh, in a lot of cases you won't see it, such as Saxel Weyman, because they've, it's meant to be hidden, only if it's dismantled will, will it become apparent. So that's a low spot. His other examples are Temple of Artemis at Sardis, again the clamps, the use of um, mortar to get it in there, very common technique. Uh, they did similar, either this picture doesn't show it, but to match columns, they would run a channel from the outside that runs through, you put a steel pin, put the column on top and then you pour in uh, molten lead, 
which are really rich, silver maybe, and to seal it up. So that's a common, but that's anaphyrosis. It's my word of the day. So with that, again, it just makes the soaring um, that much easier. And, and you'll often hear that there's no mortar used a, a lot, almost all the time, but that's just untrue uh, in the pyramids, uh, especially not in South America, but in the pyramids and other places. Very few true ashlar masonry in Egypt. There's a lot of mortar was used in there. So on the left hand side is one of their blocks before they began the fitting. And again, it's just that highlighted yellow part. Everything else is lower, it's been chiseled down. Only that portion needs to be tightly fit. Uh, basic mason, uh, ancient tools, boning rods, uh, levels. Uh, copper chisels perfect for limestone and sandstone and again that's just an example you know, these old tools they work great that's uh, Anton Antoine Garic there so he's using he's doing Ptolemaic Iron Age copper saw works just as well it would wear out faster but works just as well uh, the uh, and well then you say well how much copper will you go through well, uh, I've covered that in other, but basically whether it's drilling or cutting, you don't really lose any copper because instead of doing it dry, you have, when you're cutting, you it's the sand, it's the abrasive that's doing all the work. As you're cutting a piece of sandstone, all those little sand grains that fall off, they become abrasive. It's like sandpaper. So sand steel, sand paper, sand copper. It's all the same principle. Um, copper will wear down faster than the steel, but whether it's steel and iron that you'd want to recapture or, or copper that you want to recapture, wet that mud up, put it in a pan, wash it around, and just like an old-fashioned miner, the gold's going to be sitting there at the bottom. So whether, yeah, whether it's drilling, cutting with copper or iron, how much is lost? None, really. It's, uh, you can recapture it. Uh, there's his tool before and after use. He gives the stats, I've just translated that um, uh, on the amount of wear. Now, copper will wear faster, but uh, not. It's uh, it, the copper, it's copper, it is, a, it is metal, it is not some piss weak little thing, you know, that's f flimsy. It is copper. They, uh, they built steam engines out of arsenical copper. That was the type of copper that the Egyptians had as well. Egyptian copper is great and it compares with mild steel. So when you hear Egyptian copper tools, think mild steel, not the uh, soft ass copper you get. Uh, you've probably seen, you know, or in school that that stuff they gave you for craft arts and craft. That's not real man's copper. That that's that's kitty copper for arts and crafts, not for the real world. And so he's doing Iron Age, but also he pointed out. Lots and lots of, of copper saws have been found. Again, he's mainly focused, like here at uh, Karnak, Thebes area. And just to highlight that, you know, that where the handle is tends to be thicker on these saws. Here's a group, well, I'll put the again, links in the description. Here's a collection of saws. Now, what they have, they are stone saws. From the damage that's been done to them, they are not mislabeled uh, wood saws and more nicely is that the fact that they're inscribed with the perfect mm -hmm. god Menkpero, part of the pronunciation beloved Amun on the occasion of stretching the cord for Amun Sergezarek um, Arket Sjarket but the point stretching the cord stretching the cord was a foundation ceremony very important ritual on the building of new temples as well so stone saws copper were not theoretically in some image we have the receipts on on these types of things as well uh his their saw join after the fate so they joined this is antoine garic he joined the blocks and then they're rough on the outside and then you smooth it down just facing the stone uh, i'm going to try getting contact with him and get some better photos in that uh, there they pull the joints apart, perfectly fit, and you can see how the mortar has filled up every little nook and cranny, but perfectly clean where the joints were touching. 
They also lift up a block and the same thing, and again, you can see that anaphyrosis, all that gap that's in there for the insertion of slurry and so forth. Okay, these we've done. So that's the method, those are the results. Um, beautiful, very simple, um, incredible. Yeah, that's, it, it's, the obvious things is the hardest to see, and maybe sometimes they seem too easy, but uh, Nero also mentions with his tool, he was cutting at a centimetre a minute. Uh, very, very fast. It's, uh, if you're using a better abrasive and you could improve you know, here or there, a few little um, things even better, but as it stands, and it is, yeah, it's uh, polygonal masonry. Now, this would work on other methods as well, but he's highlighting Ptolemaic and Iron Age, but he also will point out that copper, and Egyptian copper especially, is, it's basically steel. Um, and again, they're fitting, again, like after I saw it, it was like, oh, <laughs> slap of the head, why didn't I, you know, why didn't I think of this? It's, uh, but he's, they've, you know, he's the man at Derek Karnak, he knows his business, and he's also got the, you know, a bit of funding behind him as well. Um, so, copper saw, or an iron saw, doesn't matter, but it's very simple, very beautiful, and matches up with the evidence and the tools that are found in the exit, you know, found there, and also the imagery that the Egyptians uh, left us as well. and sandstone or limestone as is shown in experiments i've done it myself you can cut it's just hard it takes longer to cut into um granite as well so that's basically it it's polygonal masonry it's one of the at least for many of them is very simple explanation um for it as well so all the links in the description again don't be intimidated uh, stone is something we conquered and and we've forgotten it and now it's turned stone has turned into you know too many science fiction you know adamantium vibranium like these impossible to work material that's that doesn't exist in in reality and stone even on that scale comparing it to the super modern materials it yields before them it is just stone don't be intimidated by stone cheerio have a good one i'll go into it more because there are a few especially in regards to you know granite and it's important stonemasons say that it's impossible to cut granite come on my tour it's no it's not true <laughs>